Hello friends, this is Self-Critical Automaton and it's time for episode 8 of my Let's Play of Bayonetta where we will be running around in the second half of chapter 3. So, kind of a boring start, straight into an Antonio's notebook. Notes on the topic of magic part 3. The magical arts of the Umbra. Their true significance is best understood in the context of how the Umbra were able to use this magic via direct contract with demons in Inferno. It is thought that these witches underwent strict training in order to master their various techniques. However, the truth is coloured by the fact that witches left people awestruck and were greatly revered. The true root of their power was none other than their ability to take unbelievably strong demon energy and bend it to their will, using it freely. The witches' direct contact saw them reaching into the heart of Inferno's darkness and summoning the beasts that dwell there, drawing out their incredible magic and destructive powers. The witches under contract with these demons were able to exercise powers far greater than any could, that could be attained by mere mortals, to the extent that some may even term these powers aggressive or brutal. A lot of this language is kind of clunky and odd, and I wonder if that's an artifact of being translated from Japanese, where perhaps it flowed more uh, smoothly. Like, of course, incredibly destructive powers are aggressive and brutal, you know? It was thanks to these powers that witches boasted such an awesome force in battle. From the Vigridian religious perspective, those living in the human world find interaction with other realms incredibly difficult. Residents of Inferno find it impossible to manifest themselves in the human world. This is why witches require some sort of catalyst to summon demons into the human world, channel channeling the spirit via this medium. The catalyst most often used by witches was their hair. It is well accepted that hair had many uses in the magical arts, and the witches called this use of their own hair the Wicked Weave. It was said to have been used not just to summon demons, but also to summon magical items, as well as forming the witches' uniforms. I would also like to touch briefly on the despair these women must have felt. To gain the incredible power afforded to them, they were forced to trade their souls to the demons of Inferno. Within the Trinity of Realities, it is believed that the deceased find their souls sent to heaven in an endless cycle of birth, death, and rebirth. However, witches were met only with a single possible fate, death, followed by endless torment in Inferno. Once one had set foot on the path of the magical arts, there lay nothing but the harsh reality that there is no turning back. Despite this fact, it was a path desired by a never-ending stream of believers. How these women captured so many hearts, minds, and imaginations remains unknown. So, yeah, we're slowly learning more about this world and its back background, but, like, I do find myself wondering how much of anything can actually be trusted. Like, you know, they believe that heaven, hell, etc., have this interrelation, but do souls exist? Do humans go to heaven and then come back to, you know, be reborn on earth? But, like, how did this system arise? Anyway, so, when I was talking about misleading um, signposting, see these? These look a lot like um, fountains that we'll see later, or very shortly, in fact, which you freeze with which time and then run across. So, if that's the case, it just looks like, you know, you're going to freeze the lava and walk across the lava, right? Do some hopping around, but actually, no. That is not the case at all. Those are just kind of fountains in the background. So, uh, yeah. I bet you can uh, guess what this big portal thing is going to do. And if you guessed to take us somewhere else, then you would in fact be correct. Oh, I've got a weapon. It is kind of irritating when you accidentally pick up a weapon without realising, because that's just a nuisance. Anyway. So, this is actually a really neat trick level design-wise. I'm not sure how they did this, or... Well, I mean, I know how they did it, but it's something that a lot of game engines struggle with, which is a seamless change. So you seamlessly come through into this zone. Um, normally there would be a loading screen, or a very short disguised loading screen, but it seems like this is just completely straight in and out. Um, can I go back? See? Completely seamless. Um, anyway, so there's a couple things hidden here, which is that... I... okay. Yep, if you hold dodge for a split second too long, you will in fact do that. So, I guess these aren't just... Um, these aren't just records from Earth, then. These, this is actually the music that they play in actual heaven. I I mean, I have to assume that because that's... It's not just dropped by an angel on Earth. That is straight up here in actual heaven. So... Oh yeah, also, um, with misleading signposting, see this? This looks a hell of a lot like 
uh, yeah, if you walk across the bridge a bit, you're fine, and if you step off it, you fall into the water and die, right? Just based on game literacy or the things you might have seen in other games. But no, look, see, you can run around freely. It's a completely flat surface. So over here is the first Alfheim portal of this episode. This should be doable. Um, hopefully I'll do it on my first try. It might take me a couple tries, though. So in I go. So this is another one that's pretty much just a straight combat challenge. All you need to do is beat all of the opponents without ever using Witch Time. Um, and I mean, it disallows Witch Time, so you can't use it by mistake. But um, aside from that, it's just combat as normal, really. So if you are bad at getting the timing, it's pretty much the same as just playing it anyway. That said, it is kind of irritating to, you know, lose something that you rely on. Um, so it's less of a fun combat challenge than most of them because it kind of breaks the flow of the combat that you're used to. You're used to always being able to dodge and sometimes a few free hits in. So when you discover that you can't do that, you find yourself just having all of your timings off because, you know, you get used to what the correct timings are. Additionally, <laughs> the final opponent is this guy who is on fire, so you kind of have to approach from the right angle. I don't actually know if that's a mechanic. Sometimes these guys seem to block attacks and sometimes they don't. I have said that this game has unclear signalling in a lot of places. It seems like some enemies, when they're on fire, you can hit, you can hit them and some enemies you can't. Uh, I don't really know what there is beyond that, to be honest. And that is going to be the end of that in just a second. That was another good ending picture, I think. Been getting a few of them lately. Uh, so yeah, that was in fact first try. Although, of course, through the magic of editing, you would never know if I had not in fact done it on my first try. So, uh, let's all just... I was going to say let's pretend that I did it on my first try, but I genuinely did, and you'll never believe me now. So, uh, notice that now that we've seen what Paradiso looks like, Alfheim looks a lot like Paradiso. That's going to be... I don't know if it'll ever be relevant, but um, when I was playing through this previously, I did notice that. Um, and then it was in fact picked up upon later, which I will not mention any further now because I'll talk about it when it comes up. But yeah, so I do find myself wondering, there's all this stuff about, you know, ancient Vigrid and their kind of ancient lost technologies or their ancient... Is it a technology if it uses magic? I guess, I guess if magic is used like a technology, it's a technology, because a technology is just something that humans have learned to manipulate for their own uses. Um, but yeah, these are the fountains that I mentioned. As you can see, I suspect they just reused the same models and animations and changed the colour, which is why it looks so noticeably similar. Um, but then that does become misleading or confusing. So before we do anything else, I'm just going to run over here and grab this. Why is there a witch heart in heaven? I do not know. Also, this over here, um, as far as I can tell, basically serves no purpose. There was a magic uh, restoration in there somewhere, but like, that's it. It's just a little place you can go. It's very unusual for there to be purposeless places in a game because, you know, everything comes out of the rendering budget, so you don't want to have spaces that the players won't go to. Um, so, you know, why is it rendered back around here? Because they hid something, so it's a nice little trick, a nice little surprise or whatever, but... Um, yeah, so that was just a random healing item, but still, it's rare to find healing items that you can carry around. So, um, I just want to point out that Bayonetta's sexuality seeps into absolutely everything. She can't just pull a big lever, she has to wrap herself sensuously around it. Um, which is actually a key part of her character. So, um... What happens here, generally speaking, is that you think, ah, oh, use, and then you press the button and then you use it. Um, this is essentially teaching you what it does so that you can use it to solve the puzzle that you're trying to solve. Namely, how do I get across that bridge that exploded? I thought that the way to get across the bridge would be to, you know, freeze time on the um, fountains and then... Um, on uh, the lava fountains and then hop across them but no you use this to restore the broken bridge because this is a magic hourglass that fixes destroyed architecture um 
so yeah, it's uh, it's a fun little way that they you know teach through experimentation. You see X to use, so you use it, and it just uh, magically restores the thing, and you think, ah, oh, okay, where can I apply that logic somewhere else? So, yep, we are going to run over here and then restore this bridge. Which, um, you know, it's a very beautiful historical city, even if it is mostly on fire now. So, um, the impulse towards restoration is probably a good one. Preservation and restoration for historic cities is kind of actually a cause quite close to my heart. But yes, yeah, so that brings that back. But before we cross, we're going to backtrack, because this game has hidden most of its secrets via backtracking, much to my frustration. I think I think that the main problem with backtracking in this game is that so many of the levels have gated sections. So, for example, um, you know, once we dropped down into this cave, we couldn't get back into the previous places that we were in. What if there was something to backtrack for there, you know? Um, and the fact that there's no way to know when these breaks in the sections will come means that there's no way to know when you should and shouldn't be backtracking, which means you either have to backtrack constantly or you have to play through every level multiple times trying to uh, redo every section backwards periodically. Anyway, um, so this is the hardest one in this chapter. Let's jump in. I will um, hand off to future me. Thanks, past me. So this is one of the combat challenges that first shows kind of the main benefit of playing the combat challenges, which is that it sort of teaches you to recontextualize your abilities and understand them on a deeper level. The fact that you can't hit them with ordinary attacks and only can hit them with the, um, you know, heavy components of the combos, the wicked weaves, means that you have to learn to some extent to time your combos right. You have to start your combo far away in order, in order to not hit with an ordinary attack. Um, because that will cancel you out of the combo with the recoil from punching something that's on fire, because you're not supposed to punch things that are on fire. Um, you'll notice I am using the Shiraba Sword for this. That's not just because it's my favourite weapon and I've been using it the whole way through. It is the best weapon for this particular kind of challenge because it has a really quick three-hit combo that... Um, in fact, I think I talked about that in a previous episode. It has a, uh, a three-hit combo that ends in a big AoE Wicked Weave. As you can see, it's pretty much the only one I'm using all the way through here. Um, it's just really convenient. But, yeah, so it's clear on some of the other challenges that we'll get to, but this is the first one that sort of shows you... Well, sort of encourages you to learn on a deeper level how these things work and how to manipulate them in the environment. It is kind of infuriating when they jump into an attack and uh, manage to force you to cancel your combo, but you know, if you get witch time it's always fine. It's actually possible to get them to sort of um, close up and stick close to one another and then their AI pretty much obeys the same rules every time so they both make the same moves at the same time so you can keep them grouped up and then whittle them both down at the same time with the big AoE hits, which is just easier and more efficient. And I managed to do that in my practice play, but not here in the for reals. Um, other than that, the challenge has the same parameters as all of the other one. A time limit and limited hit points. Huh, one just exploded. Anyway, that is... Ah yeah, that's the stun that they can cast. I think that's the first time I actually get hit by it in this let's play. I might be misremembering. Anyway, time to pass back to future me. Wait, no, past me. Time's hard. <laughs> Thanks, future me. And, uh, yep, time to just continue straight on. I do think it's irritating that even once you know what those items are, it still pops up the info box every time you get one. It doesn't do that for any other items. As far as I can tell, it is only the, um health increasing hearts and the uh, magic increasing pearls. It's just kind of an inconsistency and it's odd, you know? So yeah, as you can see, those are quite similar, uh, the fountains. So I really did think that that was going to be the solution to that puzzle, not magically make the bridge come back. Especially since that, you know, referenced into her extant power set. We already know that she can freeze time, so why wouldn't she solve the puzzle that way? So this is actually a skippable fight. There's um, several skippable fights in the game. You've quite a few um, 
quite a few missions have one or two fights that you can just um, run past. So what happens here is that if you uh, decide to just run straight past and get to the other side of the bridge, they all leave. Which is surprising, really, considering they seem quite invested in stopping you. But um, if you want to get a decent score at the end of the level, you need to hit up every single combat that you can. Right, so we fixed it, and then it just broke again. Kind of makes me wonder what the point is. Uh, anyway, this is another good example of really bad signposting. So, this platforming sequence is pretty obvious. You, you know, cartwheel your way along and dodge all of the holes and everything, and then you get here. Now, it looks like you can climb on that over there, but what you're actually supposed to do is ride this down and then jump. So, when I played this casually, I was, you know, frantically trying to jump onto that staircase that I could see. Although it's visibly a broken staircase, it still looks climbable. Um, and since the whole wait, you know, waiting of the camera is directly on that pillar ahead of you, I assumed that was where I needed to go. It took me a couple tries. Oh, ah! Uh, no, I'm alright. It actually took me a couple tries to find out that you're just supposed to ride it down. Like, which is also bad signposting because, you know, the first couple sections break, you're not supposed to ride them down, you're supposed to keep going forwards. The third section breaks, you're just supposed to know that you're supposed to ride that one into the lava, which is what you're trying to avoid. So yeah, that's my design critique of the day. A recurring segment, not really. Anyway, I was mentioning back in uh, in the Paradiso sequence that I think it's interesting. I keep saying that, that's my most common phrase. I think this is interesting, I think that's interesting, I think it's interesting that. Anyway, um, it's pretty clear that those vinyl LPs come from heaven and I completely buy that, um, you know, heaven's music storage medium of choice would in fact be vinyl LPs. Absolutely, completely buy that 100%. Which of course leaves the question of where does hell store their music? And I think you and I both know that the answer is on cassette tapes. Um, I also declare my allegiance there because cassette tapes are absolutely the cooler medium, 100%. Ah, good health upgrade. Always reassuring to grab one of those. So, we're approaching the end of this level now. There's just a little bit. Just one of these to grab. The Old Colosseum. In Vigrid's long, protracted history, there was once an enormous colosseum built facing the sea. It remains today largely intact. According to record, the colosseum was not used for martial contests or other games, but as an altar of worship for one of the era's gods, a being known as Fortitudo. So that's his name. Even today, as the urban functions of the city move to Isla del Sol, the Colosseum holds a special place in the religious beliefs of those who worship the Laguna. Even though the winds of time have long since destroyed the road leading to the structure, forcing a treacherous passage through the cliffs, the stream of those making pilgrimage to the Colosseum is endless. So yeah, um, earlier in this chapter, in fact at the very start, oh hang on, let's have a look. Yep, what a shameful loss to history. Why would, um, I'm just imagining Fortitudo sitting up there being like, why would Bayonetta do this? You know, after having set the whole fucking thing on fire. Anyway, um, yeah, he did mention a few things that are interesting. Like, there's apparently a creator. Apparently, um, Fortitudo himself was summoned back into the, into the, into the real world, or at least into, um, Waking. Let's see if I can sneak up on this crow. Ah, got it. So there's a few elements going on there that are kind of curious. Um, in one of the opening cutscenes, a whole bunch of people sacrificed themselves and it summoned an angel, so I wonder if that's connected in some way. Anyway, let's continue on to the end of this level. It is a fairly nice structure, I'll give it that. So there's also a lot of inconsistencies. Oh, how much am I going to be penalised for that? Uh, mm, not great. You know, for, what, four pla five platinums and two perfect platinums, I really thought I would get a better score than uh, gold. So that uh, that one unfortunate death really did help uh, inhibit me quite a lot. Anyway, I was saying something, but I don't remember what it was, so let's move on. Ready? Fire! 
So if you listen carefully, what the audio is behind the guy saying, ladies and gentlemen, it's uh, angel attack. I'm sure that that's one of the BGMs from one of the um, old Sonic the Hedgehog games. It really, really sounds like it to me, which again is this strange... Oops. Pro tip for all you uh, wannabe Let's Players out there, don't drop your controller just because you're using a mouse and keyboard. Uh, what was I saying? Oh yeah. Like this, this again, kind of weird references to Sonic the Hedgehog. I still don't know what's up with that. I don't know if the, the dev team had any connection to it. I suppose you might argue that there's kind of a thematic concept of like... I mean, they were talking about killing Eggman, right? In the At the very start of the game. So maybe there's this idea of... Well, this isn't, this isn't, you know, old style games. This is new, ridiculous games. This is what games are now. We're ignoring the past and killing our, you know, killing our fathers or however that quote goes. Um, but then, you know, there's something fundamentally video games to all video games, right? So even though you think you've killed it, it's still got that component in it. So even though you think you've killed it, it's still got that kind of history to it. And actually you need to remember that you are inspired by the things that came before as much as you are moving forwards past them. So uh, that is my incredibly wanky close reading of the Sonic the Hedgehog references in this game, Bayonetta. All right, let's jump into the shop real quick. Another LP? <laughs> Working me to the bone, but no need to pity me. I was bored anyways. Let me go whip some things in the shape for you. As far as I can tell, all of these cutscenes are the same, it's just the dialogue that changes. I'm also not sure if the dialogue is randomised, like the intros to whenever you go into the shop normally. Um, which for all I know is in a, is in a sequence rather than randomised actually, but anyway. It was a close one this time. This bad boy might even be hard for you to get a handle on. Take care of yourself. So, um, I love that the gaudy femininity seeps into absolutely everything. This is, like, a weirdly grown-up eyesed version of the kind of, like, you know when you would go to the pound shop as a kid and you'd see, like, uh, you know, plastic toy Sailor Moon wands and things, well, well knockoffs, at any rate. It's got that whole kind of aesthetic to it, but somehow mixed with, like, BDSM dominatrix vibes. I don't know what's up. Anyway, note the charm on the end of the handle there. It's a cat, but it's stretching so that it looks like a uh, high-heeled shoe, which is also what Bayonetta's earrings are. And I thought those were high-heeled shoes for ages until I noticed that it's the same thing. So this is the first um, one of Rodin's treasures, and it is a bonus costume item that unlocks when you unlock the um, Kasheldra whip weapon. So I'm just going to grab that because I want to grab each of those as we get them, but there's nothing else I want to get just yet because I'm still saving up for something cool. Much like, you know, a child in a pound shop who wants, you know, a horrible, gaudy, knockoff uh, Sailor Moon wand. Anyway, so that's going to be the end of this episode and I will catch you again soon for the next one. If you enjoyed this video, please like and subscribe, and there's links to my other projects in the description. Thank you so much for watching.